Thank you, guys. Thanks for uh, coming out on a Saturday afternoon. And I think it was a bit difficult after these testimonies to really uh, um, back them up because they're just amazing stories. But uh, thank you for coming out. So I um, want to kind of preface the talk by kind of telling you how I got to RMI. I uh, was, uh, I, I like to use the term, comfortably unhappy with my profession. I had been practicing interventional pain management for about a, a little over a decade. Um, and the tools we used um, were, if you look at all the research and just all the, the clinical indications for uh, the major tools we used in our little black bag to treat patients were all harmful, every single one. But we used them, and they were approved. And conventional medicine, it's OK. It said it was OK to use NSAIDs, to use opiates, to use steroids. And you just look at, just Google search uh, NSAID use, right? How many people die from NSAID toxicity? Um, you know, people having kidney disease, liver failure, I mean, not liver failure, but kidney disease and kidney failure, and then um, bleeding out because of um, NSAID use. Um, and obviously, I'm not going to touch the opiate uh, epidemic and pandemic, but we, can, we typically used opiates in, in, on a daily basis. And um, I'm going to digress a little bit, but one of the biggest frustrations in my tenure in the, the last 10 years when I left was I, my patients weren't really my patients, right? It was um, the insurance company, right? And I was held accountable to insurance providers. And when I looked at a particular, I focused on the back, and you, it, a, a super complicated case would come in, and I would just say, hey, you can only treat this little part of the spine. I'm like, you look at the picture, and you tell the patient, you need X, Y, Z, and it's going to take it's going to take two years to, to really, at this pace, to, to really help you out. And along the way, you would inevitably use opiates. And uh, my my biggest uh, my biggest problem was at the uh, at the end of my ten years there, I felt like I was just doing more harm than benefit. And uh, and uh, about uh, six weeks before I met Dr. Reardon. Um, I, I saw the podcast everyone's heard about, right? I was in, in bed watching this podcast, and I was like, wow, this guy's, this guy's amazing. But I didn't really do much research because I was in my little world. I was, like, stuck in my world saying, you know, I'm in the conventional world. And a friend of mine introduced me to him. He said, you got to meet this guy. Let's go have dinner. I said, okay. I didn't know who was, I was getting introduced to, and I, I see Dr. Reardon. I'm like, oh, my gosh. This guy's like... You know, I, I was shocked. I was shocked, and uh, I was I was a bit apprehensive because I, I, in 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 this world that I knew, it was safe and secure, and it provided me an income to provide for my family. But at the same time, I just was I was you know, Dr. Diaz. I see the the glow in his eye, and he's and he's ten years younger than me. And I'm like, okay, that's that's the kind of doctor I wanted to be. I really wanted to to really make an impact, and not create, uh, be contributing to this a huge, um, you know, epidemic of opiate crisis. Anyways, I digress. Um, I don't want to get too philosophical on this, but uh, one of the biggest tools I used is uh, steroids. Right, steroids. You know, how many people have had? A steroid injection. Raise your hands, right? Do you ever wonder why you can only get three a year? You ever wonder why? Like, why? No, why, right? If it's so good and at alleviating pain, why are we only doing it three times a year? So uh, I'm not going to really go into the the specifics of what MSCs are and all these other things because Dr. Reardon, and Dr. Diaz did a really good job at explaining that, but. Uh, you know, steroids are really a catabolic, you know, catabolic medicine, and it breaks down. I mean, otherwise we'd all be looking like Barry Bonds, right, if it was an anabolic steroid. It doesn't build anything up. It destroys tissue. It damages um, the ligaments. It damages the bone. Um, it has all sorts of deleterious effects. And so um, it, it just, you know, you look at the research, but we're still doing it. Insurance still says it's okay. You know, what happens with patients? Sorry. Okay. Um, 
So this is a little uh, cartoon kind of depicting that. Um, and this talk is much more clinical than scientific, right? I, you know, it goes scientific talks and we talk about the mean and, and uh, you know, all these predictive values and you get a little overwhelmed, but I just wanted to uh, uh, be much more clinical in our application and how I look at patients and what I do for patients, right? So in, in this world of uh, inter interventional orthopedics, I typically um, can kind of stick a needle in almost anything, whether it's a TMJ, whether it's, you know, precisely in the center of your disc or it's in your big toe. Uh, it can typically, it can, you can treat almost, almost anything, these, uh, these, this tissue product that we inject. We inject in various uh, joints as well as muscles and helps with nerve pain as well. Now this picture here um, kind of depicts for me what kind of, uh, what I was frustrated with and um, I guess this, this study came out in 2014 in the latter part of, uh, I started making my wheels turn. It's like, well, what else can I offer patients, right? And unfortunately, regenerative medicine and stem cell therapy and you know the, the tissue injections is not covered by in insurance. And so this was, you know, my patient population is typically um, older population, Medicare population, good population, but they, you know, it's just not covered. Um, however. I felt like some of the surgeries we were offering, meniscectomies, laminectomies, and you just look at the data on that, just Google it. Uh, the outcomes are poor. You know, a year out, five years out, 10 years out, a microdiscectomy is good, short term, right? Uh, it'll alleviate your leg pain. But 10 years out, you know, most people wind up with steel, uh, titanium in their back with screws in their bones. It's just, it's just not very good. And I, I felt like it was, it was, it was, it was, uh, I was not doing well. So this study here uh, is a, a study of uh, some, uh, a shoulder study. And it was, I'm gonna break this down pretty simple here. There was one cohort, one population where they did a scope in the shoulder for a partial tear of a rotator cuff and they injected MSCs in it after they finished up, sewed them up. The other population was just conventional uh, surgery you know, conventional scope to repair that rotator cuff. And in, in the green bar there, in the graph there, let me see. Well, in the green portion there, it's, it indicates that patients at six months out did much better than the patients that had conventional um, um, surgery. And so there's a re-tear uh, re of that rotator cuff at six months. Uh, in that blue graph, there's a higher population of a retear. At 10 years out, and this is kind of a gold standard study, so they followed these patients out for 10 years, and over approximately 87% didn't have a retear with the, the, of the patient population that had uh, conventional surgery with an MSE in, intraarticularly or in the joint. So that, it's like, man, this is gonna change medicine. And this is three years ago. And I, obviously I have been doing this for the last, in 30 years, like Dr. Reard, 20 years, and uh, I just needed to n know more about this. Um, this, I'm not really gonna go over, why is it not changing here? So, um, you know, I, I really wanna stress the point about what we, what we have to offer here. Um, we, in, in, the, uh, in the clinic in Southlake, we really essentially use two forms of, of stem cells. We use what we call autologous, I'm not gonna use a fancy word, but it's cells from your own body, and then we can use cells from placentally derived tissue product, which is uh, allogeneic. And so there's two different forms that we're, we, we use in our, in our, in our clinical day-to-day uh, -day use. It's part of a, cord tissue and then part of an amniotic tissue. And uh, depending on the, the disease process of the joint or the disc, uh, I, I kind of choose uh, the, which, which type of product I use uh, depending on the, on, the, on the disease process. But what's the difference with us versus any other um, regenerative um, institute in the, um, in, 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 in the world basically or in the United States is that um, at RMI, we specifically have focused tunnel-like vision on orthopedic interventions. I don't treat alopecia. I don't treat hair loss. I don't treat erectile dysfunction. I don't treat MS. I don't treat all these other conditions 
I, we, we focus on orthopedic um, issues, right? We, we have tunnel-like vision on this, and this is what makes us unique. Um, we, and I, I don't think it, we can, any other regenerative institute or uh, clinic has at access 24 hours uh, a, a lab, a lab that manufactures viable tissue product. Uh, most clinicians uh, in, in, in the real world buy their product from some third party in New Jersey or Utah or whatever, and when they get there, they literally freeze it, um, and then minutes before you inject it, you, you don't know what's in it. So we know with 100% certainty that uh, we, we, we process our own cells. It, it's, it's, uh, we know what we have. And at any point, I'm able to call our uh, chief uh, scientist at, uh, in our Dallas clinic, in our Dallas lab, and say, hey, I would like to look uh, under the microscope at some viable tissue. Let's, free, let's unfreeze this, thaw this out, and look at it and put it under a microscope and say, hey, how viable is this? And I'm able, no other clinic is able really to do that. Um, we have an active, uh, research uh, institute um, at the lab that not only it manufactures the product, but we have, uh, you know, Dr. Hernandez will actively do everything he can to utilize and, and increase the viability of that, that tissue product, whether it's 90% up to 95% viability. So we want to, we have, we have that at, at, at our access. We also have a, a clinical research segment of our, of our, of our uh, clinic where we, we have a registry where we track patients, where we look at outcomes six months or a year out, okay? So most, most clinicians will just do an injection, say, hey, come back. Uh, come back if you need us, but we, we track our patients. Um, all patients are evaluated by board certified physicians, right? If we were to go to any other clinic in, in uh, the United States, perhaps you may be, you may be talking to uh, a non-physician. The, the injection may be done by a non-physician, you know, a mid-level. Uh, um, so we have at all through this whole process, you're evaluated by a physician, treated by a physician, and all follow-ups done by a physician. Um, we also have, uh, the clinic provides um, stem cell supplements that are highly vetted and researched by, by Dr. Reardon. So today, I, I wanna, like I said, it's not gonna be super scientific, it's just gonna be clinical, and I'm gonna walk you through a couple of cases and you know how I approach patients. And essentially, I know that this picture is, is uh, just there's two ways we're gonna we're gonna talk about pictures here. This is an MRI, and we, we take pictures as if you were cutting across the sternum from chest to belly, and you're slicing like slices of bread from right to left. And in this picture, we have a, a just a cross section of, of a lumbar spine, and we're gonna talk about the lumbar spine, and I don't want this to be just focused on the spine because we treat every articulation, every joint. Uh, but in the lumbar spine, you can, you can kind of clear clearly see here that these are numbered one, two, three, four, and five. And these numbers represent the vertebral bodies or the bones. And in between each bone, there's uh, a, a spongy material called um, intervertebral disc. And, it, and I you know, always use the analogy of like, think of this as like a, a jelly donut that you buy at Dunkin' Donuts, right? So the dough of the donut is the annulus, the ligamental structure, and the nucleus is this, this hydrated portion. You make sure you remember this. It's, it looks nice and white here. That's a normal disc. And that center, center portion uh, is the jelly-like substance of that jelly donut we're gonna talk about later, right? And then behind that, and that's, that streak of white tissue there, that's fluid. That's uh, fluid that's produced in our brain. It bathes the spinal cord. And that dark substance right in between there is actually the spinal cord, OK? So remember that other analogy I was telling you about when we cut across this way? We're going to cut across this way, like slices of bread. And this is a picture of the disc, you can clearly see that, and the, the joints behind it, and the spinal cord's right in the center. And basically we have this scaffolding of bones that protects our spine. And these bones form joints, and these, these joints are called 
facet joints. And right behind that, we have the muscle layers, the back muscles, which we call the multifidus. And when I look at a patient, I break this down into fourths, right? I look at the front fourth, right? And we break this down the first zero to 25%, and that's the bones. And in between each bone, we look at the disc. So I look at that specifically and say, is there a problem there? And the second, uh, second fourth, rather, is the spinal cord, what we look at, and the, sp the fluid around the cord. Is there something pinching that cord? Is, that, is there a herniation pushing against one of the nerve roots as it's exiting? So I'm looking, this, I'm, I'm looking at this as I talk to a patient. And the third fourth I look at is these little joints, right? These little joints right in here. And these joints uh, become very inflamed, and when they become inflamed, uh, when there's arthritis there, it, it produces this caustic material, this soupy, inflammatory soup that can literally bathe the muscles behind it, right, these back muscles, and that's when we have severe spasms. And that's when you, when you have back pain, all of a sudden you're locked into position. That's literally what's going on. This soupy material is bathing those nerves, and it's like battery acid on a muscle belly, and you just lock up. So the, um, while I'm talking to a patient, I typically say, let's look at a normal back, right? Let's look at a normal back, and then toggle between their back and then uh, a normal back and their back. And then they really see, whoa, something's going on here. So some of the common causes of back problems uh, are obviously degenerative disc disease, and that's just like white hair or gray, gray hair or wrinkles of our back, uh, a bulging disc, and remember that analogy, that, that, that jelly donut? So the dough of the donut's still intact, but it's kind of bulging out, right? A herniated disc is where the, the dough is torn and that jelly-like substance is leaking out and it's leaking into uh, the canal or onto the nerve root. Um, obviously, there's multiple reasons you can have back pain, and that analogy of that soupy material that I was talking about. You see the, those white streaks? That's actually fluid in that space, right? Um, uh, adjacent to that, right in here, um, right next to it, that soupy material is leaking into that muscle belly, right? And so you can have spasms of the muscles, you can have uh, the joints being inflamed, you can have um, really, really bad arthritis. You can see in this picture over here, where chronic irritation of those bones begin to fuse and they form one big bone. So these are multiple reasons why you can have it. You can have back pain. So when we're, when we're looking at back problems, I look at the, the, the patient, I examine the patient, talk to the patient, and when you talk to a patient, it really tells you a lot about what's going on. So patients that have just back pain, no leg pain, okay. I'm thinking, okay, it could be a facet, it could be a disc, okay. But if you're having leg pain and no back pain, okay, I'm thinking a, a herniation. Is it affecting one of the nerve roots? And if I know the pain pattern in which it's distributed in, if it's going down the back of your leg, I'm thinking L5S1, right? If it's going down the front of your leg, I'm thinking L3. These are the things that are super important to have a qualified physician examine you, right? I just can't look at a picture and say, hey, um, you need this. So that's why a history, exam, and imaging is so important. Uh, there was a study, I'm gonna digress here, there was a study uh, about 10 years ago that said they got 100 random people and they got images of all these people. 70% of those patients had some abnormality, and they call it pathology disease, and 20% would warrant surgery, right? But all these patients were normal. So you don't, this is the super important point with this, is that when you talk to patients, you don't look at pictures, you talk to people, you examine them, and you look at pictures, right? Um, so when I'm looking at a herniated disc, I think, okay, I'm talking to the patient, they have leg pain, maybe some, um, some leg weakness, if they do, then I think typically in this scenario, uh, a simple epidural with uh, umbilical cord tissue works really well, right? You inject it just adjacent, right next to that disc, right where it needs to be, and it bays that area to, to shrink it down. Um, these annular tears. So remember that analogy, that do donut that I was telling you about? So in this case, the, the, the dough is actually torn, 
right? And the, the gel-like substance is leaking just enough to cause a little bit of irritation of that nerve root. So that white substance, go back here. Remember that, anal remember that picture where everything is normal? I'm just gonna, I just like looking at these things here, but um, this is normal. Abnormal, abnormal, right? These are all dehydrated. They call desiccated discs. This is a normal disc. But in this case, there's a tear. And you can just faintly see this little streak of, uh, of white substance leaking out. And that little, that little bit of substance can just irritate the nerve root. In this case, typically these patients will have just isolated back pain, maybe intermittent uh, leg pain that comes and go depending on position. Typically these patients present with just localized back pain, just very focal lack, uh, back pain that's made worse with sitting. If you're driving from here to San Antonio, you can't make it. You have to stop twice because it's so, so painful. It's very isolated. So I'm looking at a patient, they're telling me the story, I'm kind of thinking, okay, it could be an annular. These, these patients typically do very, very, very well with introducing a small amount of uh, umbilical cord tissue product into that disc. Obviously, uh, most most uh, most you know physicians aren't doing uh, are doing this, but it's you have to be super qualified to actually get into that disc to to avoid any big structures like big blood vessels or kidneys and things like that. So. Uh, introducing a little bit of tissue in there is very, very good. So this is a this is a catch-all. This is a degenerative disc disease. So in this in this in this picture, you remember that picture where there was no this has no white. There's no white in the jelly donuts. The, all the jelly's gone. It's de de desiccated or dehydrated in that case. But when this happens, you you think of a. Uh, of the of the spine as a scaffolding, right? If this disc degenerates, the this kind of the, the, the scaffolding behind that disc also are affected. The ligaments become weaker, they become lax, uh, the, actually the, thick, the ligaments will tend to grow and that will cause severe, um, this fancy word called stenosis, a narrowing of that canal. So as that ligament increases, the, the, you only have confined space in that spinal canal. So that ligament increases, you can have leg weakness, leg numbness. So um, you, could, you could see uh, these bones behind us, right, become closer in proximity, this bone and this bone. That's called the spinous process. And really thin people, when they bend over, you see those bony protrusions, that's what you're actually looking at. And so they become closer in proximity, they're almost touching each other. And they're, they're not supposed to, right? Um, so you look at the facet joint. So this is a very complicated case, right? In conventional medicine, insurance companies, the accountants, the bean counters will say, oh, no, you can only treat one. You can't treat the whole spine, right? You can't treat, you can't treat this whole big picture. And the beauty of regenerative medicine and, and, um, is that I'm able to address every single thing. You know, an epidural would literally take me less than a minute, right, to do, but it's not really doing much. But when I do complicated spine cases, it, it'll take me 30, 40 minutes to address every single structure, right? The disc, the spinal canal, the ligaments, the, the facet joints, the joints behind it. So you have to really take a comprehensive picture and, and look at this. Um, and that's why I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful to, to be offering this um, to my patients. Uh, that's just, this is a picture here of basically some facet uh, or, you know, joint inflammation. We had talked about that all right, already. Uh, typically we can uh, insert a small thin needle into that space and um, inundate and bathe that joint with um, umbilical cord tissue uh, and uh, patients do very well. Once again, these patients typically present with just localized pain that's kind of off midline that refers into the butt, refers down in the hamstring. Uh, you know, just talking to patients, kind of telling me their story. I really get a lot of data from that. This is another picture, it's a beautiful picture here of uh, depicting what happens is we get older and we don't use those muscles, right? This is a nice 
high, you know, well vascular muscle, lots of blood supply, lots of blood, uh, blood vessels there, keeping it, the nourishment into that muscle belly as we get older and we, dis- we don't use that muscle, uh, it becomes very fatty. And that, that, it's a term we call the atrophy and wasting of that muscle. And what we're able to do, and this is kind of a difference between a Wagyu and a Kobe steak and a lean piece of meat, right? But so in this case, we're able to just bathe that area with, um, you know, umbilical cord tissue product or uh, amniotic tissue product or even bone marrow aspirate into this space and it, it, it increases the, what the process called angiogenesis. So it basically allows for new blood vessel growth into that muscle belly. It's like fertilizing your grass, right? And you're literally irrigating that grass uh, so that it becomes, it converts from this to this to this. And that's the idea. Uh, last thing I'll talk about specifically uh, is SI joint. Uh, most of us have heard some, some form of SI joint dysfunction. It's basically you know, pain in the buttock area. Um, it can refer maybe a little bit in a hamstring. And this is where it becomes very uh, important for have, to have an cl- uh, you know, experienced clinician examine you. So you know, why couldn't it be facet pain? How do you examine that? You really literally have to examine the patient. You have to, you know, hyperextend the back with the twisting mechanisms. Like, okay, that, that elicits pain in the, in, in the, in the, in the back. Uh, and there's specific maneuvers to, to isolate this joint to say, okay, this is where we need to stick the needle. Um, and I, I, d- I don't want to just kind of just focus just on the back, even though I have a passion for it, but we inject every articulation, like I said before, uh, from a, a TMJ to your thumb to um, your hip and a complicated um, space like the spine or even the cervical, the neck or the mid-back, which are difficult places to, to get a needle millimeters from your spinal cord. Some final thoughts and in conclusion, um, I just want to make sure that there's two important take home messages with this is that, uh, you know, obviously stem cell therapy uh, is not for everyone. Two things, you have to have the right clinician, right? The right trained person diagnosing, looking at you, examining you. And the second, probably the most important thing is you can have a kind of a, a weird doctor, a weak doctor, but if you inject highly you know, viable tissue into that space, it's going to do well no matter what. So the two take-home messages is getting the right physician and getting the right product into that space. Um, and it's about a grading and improvement. So it, the, the, the main thing I'd li- I tell m- most of my patients, and they ask me, should we get an MRI a- six weeks after we do these injections? And no. You know, the real uh, you know, goal of success is outcomes. Like if, uh, if you couldn't play with your grandkids, but now you're able to play with your grandkids, home run. If you couldn't walk, now you're able to walk two miles, home run. If you couldn't garden and your passion was to garden and now you can garden without any pain, home run. I don't typically, it's a waste of money and a waste of you know, to, to repeat images and you have exposure. If you want to get x-rays, it's, it's not necessary. Um, at RMI, and I can't speak to, to the, the clinic in Panama, but RMI, we focus on what we know, what we can do. We don't dabble. We don't have a potpourri of, of different things that we, we treat. We, we have tunnel-like vision on what we do. Um, we provide the highest quality and most viable tissue in the market, hands down. Um, and uh, our treatment co- protocols are s- comprehensive and individualized uh, to our patients. And um, I think that Dr. Riordan stole my thunder when he, he said that uh, stem cell research can revolutionize medicine more than any other uh, thing since antibiotics. And uh, along with vaccines and antibiotics, this is gonna change medicine, the way we treat patients, the way we look at surgeries. Uh, and I think uh, it's coming soon, I hope it does, for, the, for, for you guys. Thank you.